Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. This week we're back on my website where we're adding a section under the channel heading and we're going to add a little video section to showcase some of the series. So in this case, since I've just finished it, I'm going to do the life of Admiral Nelson once I remember how to spell, obviously. Take out the subheading because I think it's fairly self-explanatory and you can see the block I've added already has two video segments. We will need four but we're just going to go into edit and you see the various options, but right up top we've got replace and we can replace it with handily a YouTube link. So I can put that in and it handily tells me that the video is live ready to use. And there you go. There's part one, switch over to this side. There's part two. And now I'm just going to duplicate that first one because it's in the right shape and size. I want it, drag it over on this grid format and drag it over again. And it snaps two. there we go. We now have four. And then I just go and put in the link to part three and move over here, put in the link to part four and we're all done. Look at that. The Admiral Nelson series can now be viewed all in one place on the Drake NFL website. Start to finish, including finding the links less than a few minutes. Pretty easy, all told. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakenafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the wreck of Akagi along with John Parshall, or should we say John Parshall showed us the wreck of Akagi, because let's face it, he's the expert in this matter. And now we're going to look at the second part of the recording that we did back at the beginning of the month, because now it's time to look at well, what's left of Carga and, of course, USS Yorktown. So let's get on with that. OK, so on to Carga. Yeah. OK, so the ROV comes down uh, somewhere near the stern on the starboard side of Carga. And what's interesting about this is you can see that sort of tumble home, you know, the rounded feature. We're just above her armor belt uh, towards the rear end of the ship. So why don't you freeze it here? And I'm just going to start with um, it's it's really tough to envision envision this ship because Kaga is demolished on the bottom. I mean, she is a hot mess. So I'm just going to start with. This illustration, and anybody who's who's read Shattered Sword will be familiar with this illustration. This is a depiction of what we think she looked like when we were writing this book back, you know, around 2000. Um, and this was based on an eyewitness account from a Japanese aviator, a guy named Yoshino Haruo, who was along on the original expedition in 1998. Eight, when Robert Ballard went and actually found the Yorktown, and he also took a look for the Japanese ships. He didn't find them. But one of the guys on that expedition uh, was Chuck Haberline, a friend of mine who used to be the photo curator at the Navy Yard. And Chuck had uh, just a, a simple line drawing of Kaga, and he gave it to Yoshino-san and said, you know, can you basically sketch out what the ship looked like? And what Yoshino did was he took an eraser and he just went, and erased out basically everything aft of the bridge of the ship. And so what you can see is that the fires and the induced explosions chewed through her hangar deck levels until they came right down to the level of the casemate guns back there in the rear. And if I had to do this drawing over again, I would actually get rid of this uh, rear section of flight deck as well. I'm pretty sure it was gone too. But the sort of astonishing thing that we're going to see as we look in this footage is that this drawing is pretty damned accurate, okay? This is what she kind of looked like when she left the surface. And when we were, when the ROV was in position to take more of a top-down view, what you find is that the armored deck was the fire break. That's where the fires couldn't make it past. But pretty much everything in the aft portion of the ship is gone right down to the level of that armor deck. So 
what we're looking at right now in this piece of footage, we're down here someplace. We can see that tumble home because of, of her armor belt. But, you know, I think we're in this section of the woods looking at, at some of these portholes and where her casemate guns would have been. One of the other interesting realizations, and we'll see this in the footage. Okay, so Kaga had 10 of these casemate guns, five on each side. She was a battleship hull. And a lot of those are gone um, because there was not a lot of superstructure above those casemates to hold them in place. And we theorize that she may have rolled over when she sank because a number of those casemate guns are completely gone, gone. Um, so again, yeah, she's just, she's demolished. Absolutely demolished. Yeah, I mean, it's, horrifying it's like there's not there's not even a con single continuous deck above the the armor mm -hmm. belt and the armor belt isn't exactly close to the main deck level right okay so here's one of those casemates mm -hmm. and i think this is again on the starboard side of the ship so if you freeze mm -hmm. here yeah and i've got a i've got a little drawing um one of the things that's interesting over on the right side of your screen you can see the this sort of curved section of decking, right? And that curvature fits nicely with where one of her turrets would have been. But how did it end up outboard of the turret itself? You know, and we're seeing the roller track here of the, the well in which that, um, you know, the turret would have been right on top of this. Mm -hmm. So let me show you my interpretation of what I think is going on here. And this could be totally wrong, but it was the only way that I could wrap my head around it in 3D. All right, one more time. So what we're seeing here, you know, here is the roller track. Here would have been all the ammunition. The turret is actually would have been right on top of this. This blue section is actually would have been vertical plating at the time that's that's her side hull and then this deck here that curvature would have would have snugged right up against the base of one of those turrets and so from a vertical standpoint you know we have yellow deck blue bulkhead and then purple deck and the turret would have been right up here in orange what seems to have happened i think is yeah this thing First of all, it wasn't in great shape when it left the surface. It then rolls over, falls through the water column, and when it hits the bottom, or maybe even before the bottom, it basically just gets pancaked. And so the whole thing gets, you know, rolled flat, if you will, so that what used to be this, you know, three-dimensional structure is now essentially two-dimensional. And that's how the lip of that uh, that turret ends up well away from. Uh, the roller track itself and is just kind of draped out and hanging in space. Again, this could be totally bogus. I could be completely out to lunch on this, but it was the only way that in my mind I could unfold this 3D structure and somehow try to make sense of what I was looking at. Yeah, there's not there's not enough curling around the edges for it to have been blasted open while the ship was still on the surface. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. Pretty weird. Just the eerie is like looking down there. It's like somewhere down there is the magazine. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Hmm. Anywho, yeah, you can fast forward. And here we are right back again at that same section of ship. You see that here, yeah, there's some stuff been twisted over. Yeah, that's plating that's been ripped away, and we're actually looking, you know, right into her innards. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Kaga lost uh, about 30 feet of her stern as well uh, when she sank. So yeah, there we are looking right through there. Oh, the hull paint's still there. Yeah. Yeah. And things like rivets and so forth. Mm -hmm. Same section. Yeah, they... <laughs> You can see that the expedition team was uh, kind of grasping for material here because yeah. not a lot of recognizable portions of the ship, I got to tell you. 
Uh, so this is the same section, just looking a bit further along. Yeah, a little further up. And they did the same general circumnavigation, you know, started in the starboard rear, went around it. Um, yeah, she's a mess. Big section of junk here. Yeah, keep going. Again, incredibly difficult to figure out what we're looking at, where this was in the ship. There were big some void, moments here. It? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Is there the big void just ahead there? Yeah. And this may be a portion, you know, of some of the uh, the armor deck as well or, or above the armor deck. Th there were there was a moment when we could clearly see the armor deck and we were in the rear of the ship. And, you know, just thinking about, OK, right underneath that armor deck is the engineering spaces where she lost. 260 some of her engineers are entombed, you know, right underneath that space. They were trapped in the engine rooms. They couldn't get out. And you're basically roasted to death as this ship. Um, okay, so freeze right here. This is kind of neat. So what we're looking at here is a section of, this is actually below her uh, lower hangar deck. But what we've got is one of the supports for her gun tub. So I think we're in this neck of the wood, and we are looking at probably this right here. So we're looking vertically down into this structure that would have been a kind of a pylon that holds up this five-inch mount that is way up at the, the level of the upper hangar deck. And that, you know, all that structure is gone. But we still see just the the trailing edge here, uh, the top of one of that of the support structure. And you can see too, you know, we got these little holes here. They were doing anything they could to save weight in these structures. And in fact, one of the sort of what I want to say, telltale features of a lot of these Japanese carriers, particularly the early ones, is all of the supports that are holding the gun tubs up on the side of the hangar deck, all of those have got you know, holes drilled through them for weight saving because these, again, were very tall ships because of that mm -hmm. double hangar deck configuration, 65 feet up to that flight deck. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to know what the metacentric height you know, <laughs> problems that the ship might have potentially had, but they were doing everything they could to save weight. And you see evidence of that here, you know, that, that, you know, little holes drilled in there just to save any bit of weight that they can, that they can save. Yeah, let's fast forward. Cog is not going to take us long because there's just very little that's recognizable. Yeah, so we're sort of going it's along. Twisted yeah. out. Yep, all twisted away. It basically just looks like she's been blown open like a flower, right? just at this little level just above the belt armor. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a ship, for a ship that didn't suffer an actual an actual magazine detonation, it, it's right. been really shredded. She's just a mess and it was funny too during the the commentary you know the, the questions were coming in from the audience during the live stream and they're like well what does this tell us about you know the initial bomb hits and i couldn't speak directly to them and i'm sort of chortling to myself it's like the initial bomb hits had nothing to do with this okay what's going on with this ship is first of all she suffers a massive fuel air explosion right after the attack probably within three four minutes of the initial hits a la the damage that was done to the USS Franklin. Same thing. Fuel mains get burst open. You've got gasoline just cascading across this rapidly heating up deck. It vaporizes and then boom. So that's one thing that happens. But then she's got, I forget the amount, but it's I think 40 or 50,000 pounds worth of ordnance were sitting on these hangar decks in the form of torpedoes that have been rolled up against the bulkheads and yada, yada, yada. All of that stuff ends up cooking off later on. And that's what contributes to the, to the damage profile that we see. All right, so here is one of her uh, casemate mounts. This is on her port side aft. We're on the other side of the ship now. But uh, you can see that this one at least is is a little more contiguous uh, and has not fallen out of its roller track. 
the one just aft of this, which we don't get to see in this footage, uh, has lost its mm -hmm. gun barrel. And the ones forward of it have fallen out of their roller track. So again, yeah, blasted down really pretty close to the to the level of the armor belt in the deck. You can see the plating just kind of stops there on the left. Mm -hmm. Kind of cool, though. You can see that sort of domed structure on the top of the casemate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got this little curved domey kind of thing. But very recognizable. And again, she sunk pretty deep in the in the in the mud as well. That mud line is not even yeah. a casement height below this. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice shot right there. Well, and you think about, you know, her hull, her lower hull, is commendably durable, right? I mean, everything above it is is blown away. But she was a battleship, and she did mm. not suffer a magazine explosion. And so, yeah, you've got this forty thousand ton hulk that lands in a, you know, contiguous chunk on the bottom. And I'm sure it, you know, there was a pretty big plume of mud getting blown away. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, you have that, that odd circumstance, don't you? She, she's completely wrecked. She's dead as a warship. Yeah. But her citadel from her battleship days is actually doing its job because at the end of all that, she's still afloat. They have to torpedo her to make her go under. Yeah, and we're going to see evidence of that a little later on in this footage. Why don't you go ahead? Mm -hmm. I mean, I like case maces. Okay, here's another shot of that okay. same piece of wreckage. And and this, you can see that the circular indentation on that right-hand piece is much more mm -hmm. evident. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know what's going on there. All right. They went right. back. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so this... Um, yeah, stop right here. The This is hard to interpret because it's a big mess. Um, and they don't show you one of the critical pieces of data, but as we were going over this thing, this is a big chunk of wreckage that is actually not attached to the ship. It landed to the the starboard side about 40, 50 meters away from the ship. And my friend Jeff Morris, uh, who was part of the original Nauticos team and who's done a lot of this kind of stuff, as they were going over this artifact, he's like, this is a big piece of wreckage. This thing is, you know, we're not seeing all of it here, but the chunk that landed there is probably, he thinks, 80 to 90 meters worth of wreckage. And the other thing that I spotted in it at one point was one of the flight deck supports. So let me, again, go back to that overview of Kaga in her damaged state basically that piece of wreckage seems to be this this you know, pretty pretty substantial chunk of her forward hangar decks and those of you who are intimately familiar with japanese carriers will immediately recognize that my drawing is wrong that when i drew this in 1999 um we thought that Kaga's flight deck was held up by four support, two on each side. It turns out recent scholarship has demonstrated that actually she had three supports on either side. And so, anyway, for what that's worth, uh, don't bust my chops for my 1999 era drawing. But what I saw was the rearmost of these support structures seemed to be reasonably um, still semi attached to this chunk of wreckage. So, again, that supports the notion that this drawing that we did is reasonably accurate, that when Kaga left the surface, her forward hangar deck and flight deck was still reasonably intact. She rolls, she lands, and this chunk of junk either fell off in the water column or came off. It probably it would have had to have come off, I would think, in the water column fairly low down because... It doesn't land right next to the ship. It's a good 40, 50 meters away from the ship. But again, we can see the remains of what had been those hangars uh, fairly close to the ship. And the fact that it is so close supports the idea that it was still attached to the ship when it did leave the surface. And it's just been ripped apart by the force of the water on the way down. Yeah. Yeah, so the... It can't have had can't have had much strength left to it at that point, right? 
that's a, that is a complete mess. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I, really I was about was. to say it looks like a bomb site there, as it, it, it literally is. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, this is this is all the the result again of those hours long fires and induced explosions. I should mention that one of the things that's interesting about the expedition is the actual physical location of the remains in relation to each other. And I can't go into details because we don't want to share any mm. exact positional data of these ships because we don't want Chinese aqua bandits one day, you know, coming over and trying to pill yeah. for these wrecks the way that they rape Prince of Wales and, and repulse. Um, but you remember that chunk of wreckage that was found in 1999 that led to this whole book. OK, well, that that chunk, which was a portion of the upper starboard gun galleries two 25 millimeter tubs and obviously there's none of that stuff left on kaga's wreck well it turns out that chunk is a long way away from the main wreck of kaga multiple miles and in the intervening 20 some years tony and i my co-author have had this ongoing debate about when did that chunk get formed was it early in kaga's ordeal or was it late and I was always in the late camp. I was like, there's no way that chunks of this ship are getting blown off until, you know, we've had a multi-hour long fire and induced explosions that are weakening, weakening the hull structure and yada, yada, yada. Tony was like, man, that fuel air explosion could have knocked that thing off like right then and there. And I have to say that on the basis of our new knowledge of where that chunk is vis-a-vis -vis the main wreck of Kaga, I had to go back to Tony and say, you're right, and I am less right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, again, that was, pretty, that was pretty cool that we were able to, you know, gain some insight into the physical configuration of the, of the battlefield. All right, this last section that we're looking at, and this doesn't look like much of anything, but you can see this darker blue portion here. Mm -hmm. um, that's a torpedo hull. So, and we know where it is relative um, on the ship because even though, again, we're we're blown down right down to the armor deck here, they were able to take a sonar measurement and from the bow and the stern, and we were able to place it. So let me show it to you real quick. yeah we're looking right here on the hull and based on those sonar measurements that hit is basically right underneath where her bridge would have been and so when she is scuttled at about seven o'clock that evening they fire a number of long lances at her uh hajikaze and and i forget the other destroyer uh, and they hit her with at least one, and this is the the hull resulting from that. They had some other footage. It's not necessarily here uh, on this first release, but you could see, you know, it, it was very clear. <laughs> it's just yeah. blown in the sides. Yeah. And again, this gives you an idea of just how little of the ship is left, because obviously this this hull would have been below the water line or at the water line. Yeah. at the time yeah. that it was formed and now it's at the right. mud line and as you can see there are a huge amount above that either yeah again right there right really there. isn't much of this ship left is there it's almost no. almost reverted to american civil war a monitor style yeah no that's that's that you got it right on the money she is she is demolished it's a shame i i had really hoped to see more of her on the bottom than we do but it just it gives testament to the terrible, terrible ordeal that she suffered and makes it more understandable why her body count is the highest of any of the Japanese carriers. I mean, she lost 811 men during this fight. It's, it's pretty awful. All right. That pretty much is a wrap for, for Kaga, I got to say. And another chunk of... This is fairly forward, I believe, on her starboard bow. And we were kind of looking at this and what's that? Was, uh, let's see. <laughs> we call that in the business a twisted piece of wreckage. You know? <laughs> yeah. I'll be damned if I know what that is. Yeah. Anchor that's chains. That are, yeah, that's the bow. 
this is actually pretty cool. You can see her anchor chains. You can see her bollards. Um, and I can I can show you a screen cap of that. I've forgotten about this. Let me do that. Yeah, there we go. You can immediately yeah. see how the 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 bow here though is a a, a bit more bluff than um, yes. the Kagi. Yes, this is a much wider uh, a much wider hull structure. So yeah, we can see your bollards mm -hmm. there. We can see uh, a capstan of some sort, and here's a companionway that goes, you know, down below the deck, and then yeah, the the anchor chain very clearly visible. But yeah, you're absolutely right on the money. She's a much a much uh, beamier vessel. I think this is about the most intact bit of her we've seen thus far. Yeah, no, very good point. Yeah, there's a, they're zooming in right in on that. Well, and the reason that it's the most intact is because there wasn't fire damage here. Mm. This is where her survivors would have been clustered as well. It's just really odd, isn't it? It's like you see all that colossal damage further aft, and then there, the anchor chain is laid out nice and straight, yeah. as if nothing's happened. Right, right. Anyway, mm. that's pretty much a wrap on Kaga. Yeah. Okie dokie. All right, let's. Uh... Here we go. Here's Yorktown. Yeah. Well, at least the island's there. <laughs> yeah. This is the forward edge of her stack that you're seeing. And now we're sort of panning forward to where her, her bridge is. Yeah. Hmm. In? Yeah. Where are we getting in? One of the comments that my friend Seth Paradin made about this is that from the time that we've seen this footage to the last time she was filmed, uh, there is noticeable degradation now in her uh, in her stack. And he attributes that, and I think correctly, to the fact that, you know, she was a fire uh, during that after the dive bomber attack. You know, the, she took a took a bomb hit that knocked a number of her boilers offline and then you know you can see from the photography and and the motion photography mm -hmm. too that she was heavily afire in the engineering spaces for a while um and there's this black smoke just pouring out of her funnel which is very high temperature and uh, high temperatures like that tend to do bad things to metal so that when they are then exposed to uh corrosion forces later on yeah they are more badly degraded i'm not exactly sure where okay well there clearly we're looking at there's one of her five inch guns mm. sort of coming into view ghostly so we're up close to the uh to the level of her flight deck again and i believe this is on her starboard side forward she doesn't so unless i'm misreading this she doesn't look to be sitting as deeply in the mud as the akagi and Kaga. yeah she's not and we'll see that when we get up to her bow as well that yeah she's she's not as deeply embedded and and again in comparison to what we've just been looking at on Kaga, you know, the devastation of Kaga, the fact that we can still see her mounts are in good condition. You can see the, you know, the railing here uh, for the gun tubs is all still uh, in place, except in those portions where they actually cut it away, uh, trying to save weight. And we'll see some, some of that a little later in the footage as well. Oh, the cabling cool. as well of some sort. Yes. And there's another gun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we get both both of the I, again, I believe these are the starboard forward pair of five inch thirty eights. And that must mean that means the flight deck's still there as well. It is. Yep. Yeah, that looks like with a bit of cleaning, you could probably get that operational again. Yeah. I mean the, the joke would be, ah, that'll buff out, you know. 
the, the, but I mean, to be yeah, the, she, the, the paint and everything is still mostly intact. Yeah. Which says a number of things. Uh, first, it tells you that her her damage obviously was just not nearly as bad topside. She did not suffer the same sort of fires that, that the two Japanese carriers we've just seen suffered. The other thing is, it's so cool that you can see the stairs there up to the flight deck. Yeah. Up, really cool. These Yorktown-class carriers were just, Jesus, they were great ships. You know, just so well-built, really, really durable designs. Um, we should doubly impressive considering that they're not actually the the size the u.s navy actually wanted they are kind yeah. of like a little bit downsized from what they wanted so that if they could see if they could fit an extra hull into the treaty limits yeah so they, yeah. they cut corners in some places but clearly not in the overall quality of the build yes that's right these ships were tough another mm -hmm. shot Okay, so this is a different section of, or actually it may be the same, but you can see here they cut away um, some of the, yeah, some of the plating. Mm. They were getting ready to ditch these guns is what they were trying to do. Um, but by the time they they get to that point, I I can't remember if this was occurring before, it, before or after they sent the salvage team back. But, you know, they were clearly trying to do what they could to to lighten her load. All right, so now we are up uh, in her bow area, and you can see she's got, yeah, up those twenty mils. Uh huh. And we're also looking at the the forward end of the flight deck here. That little uh, tub that's hanging off the flight deck on the extreme yes. end. Yeah, there would have been some sort of a mount in there as well. Um, either a water-cooled 50 or a 20 millimeter. And uh, as I say, my, my friend Seth was has been beating his brains out trying to figure out which of those two mounts it actually was and can't come to a determination. Yeah, but as yeah, you said earlier, the, the mud line's much further down here. You can see the, it's yeah. a bit ghostly yeah. at the moment. You can see the anchor's still there as well. Right. Yeah, um, really cool shot. It's got a fair way up. You got a fair way down till you hit the mud on this. Mm -hmm. And also, as you pointed out, yeah, the flight deck is is still com completely intact. It's pretty neat. It's weird to think this is probably the one of I don't know what the state. I think Hornets Hornets probably in slightly worse shape. I would imagine. Yeah, I think so. so it's weird to think this is this is the most intact Yorktown class hull. <laughs> Right. It's out there. Yeah. After the yeah. crime that was turning Enterprise into razor blades. Preach, brother. I just I I just I still can't get my head around. Here's the that port side anti aircraft mm -hmm. mount. Yeah. Yeah. How can you scrap Enterprise? It just it still boggles the mind. Mm -hmm. But yeah, look at look at how beautifully in shape this ship is, even after 81 years. One interesting to know what that weird yellow sort of sea sponge stuff is because whatever it is, it I've noticed in the last few sections, it really seems to love gun mounts. Yeah, there's a little yeah. bit of it on the on the hull, right further back on the five inch mounts as well it, as well as here. It's all clustered around the gun mountings themselves. Yeah, maybe there's yummy grease there or something to to yeah. eat. I don't know. But yeah, the fact that you can see the the holes. Uh, that were drilled in some of the the support structures there. It's just mm. all neat and clean. Here's some more of these gun tubs. These are some of the either the twenties or the fifties uh, along the side. And here you can see very clear evidence of uh, the weight saving stuff they were trying to do. They've not only cut away the shields, but the mounts are gone too. They shoved those over the side just to, to try to lighten the ship. You know, so we're looking into the side of the hangar here, and we're also seeing you know a door. Uh, a hatch on the side of the ship and now we're looking directly under those tubs and into her hangar deck pretty cool i wonder if there's any aircraft still in there probably yeah uh you're never going to get an rov in there though because again this is <laughs> as an rov driver yeah the last thing you want to do is drive 
<laughs> drive your ROV through that through that hole. But um, there are pictures. So we'll, Go ahead. I was listening. So what we need someone to do is to invent little little ROVs you can strap to the side of a man sub and send yeah. down and wirelessly control. Yeah. And make them cheap enough that we don't mind if they get stuck. <laughs> Well, there is photography from the battle uh, when they're fighting the fire down in this neck of the woods after one of the bomb hits. Um, there are aircraft that were trussed up into the overheads. There was a Dauntless that was down there, and there was also uh, a Wildcat uh, that was sitting on the deck and, and was kind of smoking at the at the time as well. So, yeah, I'm I'm quite certain there are still aircraft in there. Another neat shot of the side of the looking through into the hangar deck, and you can see this this uh, companionway, the stairway there. Yeah, super super cool. I th I think whoever, I mean, we probably know the formula, but I think we need to get in contact with whoever was uh, in charge of formulating the paint back in the nineteen forties. Yeah, yeah they knew uh, what they were doing. Yeah, the the side of the ship looks better than some ships that have gone out for a six month deployment. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this section here, this is right by one of the aerial torpedo hits, and you can see that the the catwalk and stuff has just been blown upward by the by the plume. So this is the port side of the ship, um, and this is the result of you know Tomonaga's final attack against uh against Yorktown where Tomonaga gets uh shot down and killed and I'm forgetting the gentleman's name I believe it's Morinaga uh who puts the the fish in no it's Hashimoto uh that puts the fish into the the side of of uh Yorktown here and that's going to lead to a very heavy list and that eventually you know leads to her her being abandoned, she was listing at about 26 degrees at one point, and Captain Buckmaster is like, you know, if, if this trend line continues and this ship rolls over, I've got any number of, you know, I got hundreds of guys who are going to be drowned in the engineering spaces, not to mention everybody that's on deck is going to be caught in the downwash too. And he, you know, I think very rightly orders the ship abandoned at that point. She does not end up sinking, obviously, at that at that point. She's very low down on her port side. The the sea is lapping up right against the, the hangar deck, but she would have been salvageable. In fact, they are sending a tug, uh, the Vireo, to come out and drag her home when uh, I-168 under uh, Captain Tanabe comes in and, and does her away on the on the seventh. But yeah, just that's just a really neat little detail of the, you know, the force of that upward mm. water spout from that aerial torpedo, just knocking that catwalk up. Yeah. Cause that's not, that's not the shock of the uh, actual impact itself. The explosion would have been vented into the ship's side. That's all just. Right. Up just water. Exactly. Yeah. The water spout. I what those spherical things are. Yeah. Some, some sort of, some kind of pipe work. Yeah, there's like oxygen tanks or something, right? You can see them up there. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Pretty cool. Cabling. Ex still for experts, experts. experts in the yeah, layout of Yorktown class, write in below and tell us yeah, exactly. what, are, what are the strange <laughs> cylinders we are attached yeah. to the outside of the ship. This is where John begs off and says, I'm a big picture operational leather list. <laughs> <laughs> right? Super cool. get a bit further forward yeah we're presumably looking into the hangar again right into the hangar there's some sort of vertical risers there riser pipes of some sort don't know what they're for and an adorable little anemone yeah <laughs> yeah this yeah, this, just... this rig has a little bit more rust than the other two You've yeah got rusticles yeah. there just up, up top but again, the is, fact I, that the, the piping is still in perfect condition, essentially, mm. you know, it's just this wreck is in amazing shape, given you know how long it's been down there. Ooh. 
little bit blurred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure where we are here. This may be the stern. Yeah, it is. Looks like it, yeah. Okay, so the stern's a little bit more in the mud than the bow is. Yeah. Well, that, that in and of itself is quite interesting, because that means that she's probably hit stern first. Uh, yes, she did, because she sank stern first, barely. Mm -hmm. You can see that there was a 20-millimeter Orlikan mount. It's in the upper right mm -hmm. portion of your, of your screen, oh, yeah. right there. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, so they had a pair of Orlikans down there. You can see the shield wrapped around. And I was like, man, that's a weird place to put Orlikans. You know, that's not exactly great sky arcs, but it, it's absolutely clear that that's mm. what they were. It reminds me of um, during the Guadalcanal campaign, obviously a few months later, there's a, I can't remember if it's after Eastern Solomons or Santa Cruz, it's after one of the two, but there's a report from Enterprise where whoever's written the report is at one point suggesting, well, can we take some of the belt armor off and use the freed up weight to add right. even more 20 mils? Right, right. Which, yeah, gives you a, a sense for just how urgent that need was at the time. That, yeah, any place that there's spare deck space, we're slapping these things down as, as fast as we can. So this is a bit of twisted plating. Yeah. Not sure where that's mm. from. And we're and back here at we the are. bow. Back at the bow again. Yes, this is the port bow. Yeah. Little round down. Yep. And again, the fact that you can see those weight saving uh circular holes in the round mm. down there. I just the detail on this ship is just it's amazing. Again, the contrast between this and Kaga, which is just this lump of charred steel sitting on the bottom. Pretty yeah, all, dramatic. all of the, the, this equivalent is gone on, um, on cargo, yeah. and even to be honest, on on as you said Mostly. on a on on a margi on a yeah a cargi uh, yeah you know that's what was mostly if we were looking at a cargi at this point there'd be a massive upward arc of blown out material right in the in the middle yeah ah there's ah Chicago yes. piano yes yep some of the one ones. <laughs> At least her island's still mostly there. Yeah, and this is the forward end of her island, obviously. And again, just from the standpoint of history, knowing that you know Fletcher was standing right there, right along with Captain Buckmaster as they're fighting this battle, um, it it just really makes it easy to sort of put yourself in their shoes. We can imagine where they were because it's right here on the screen. You know, we're looking at it. Mm. And there's even some of the fixtures and fittings. Yeah. And that, yeah. that looks like, I was about to pop back up, maybe a, oh, yes, one of the PA loud hailers or something similar to that, just above that yeah. porthole. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is super neat. It looks vaguely bell shaped, but it's probably not the bell. Obviously, they were and doing a little zoom match. Yep. Now we're up right at the level. Yeah. So we're looking right into her bridge. Oh, it might Moses. be a bell, actually. Yeah, I don't I'm know. Just looking at that, that bit there, it, it looks vaguely bell shaped. It I does just look it like a bell. Not could we? You could be right. A bit of this plating's gone away. Well, now, where are we here? <laughs> Still around the mount? bridge. I think. Um, I think this is one of her Mark Thirty Three directors. I think they're going to mm. zoom out a little bit. Yeah. That's, I think that's what we're looking at. So this is right on the top of the bridge. Oh, yeah. yeah right. Say, it's a mount of some kind with those, those rotation rings. Yeah. And I, I wasn't sure if it was Mark 37 or Mark 33. I think it's Mark 33, the earlier. And, you know, mm. again, if, the, if this ship, if this ship had survived the battle, you know, she was going back for a refit and she would have been completely revamped with Mark 37 and, um, you know, all the, the newest bells and whistles. Mm. Just as if, if if Akagi had survived the battle, she mm. was going back for a refit and she would have been fit with uh with five inch anti aircraft mm. rather than the uh the uh the old four point sevens that she had. There's an open locker just there next to the uh mm -hmm. director. 
Yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, with the hatch open. Just yeah. Just fascinating how much um how much yeah, of this yeah. island is there, isn't it? I mean, it's not exactly the world's strongest strongest built structure. There's there's a little bit knocked off the top. Yeah. Whether that's yeah. decay or that battle damage, who knows? But it's substantially it's there. Here. It's substantially there. I mean, with very recognizable features. Mm. Bit of a list to it though. She's she's come down partially on her side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we saw that when we were back in the stern as well. The, yeah, yeah, she's definitely taken on a bit of a list. But yeah, she just she really is in remarkably good shape. And no people in the chat, all you ask, no one in their right mind is going to try and salvage her, good shape or not. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, if, for all that you know, what happened to Repulse and Prince of Wales is is enraging. The fact that these wrecks are down at fifteen, seventeen, eighteen thousand feet means mm -hmm. that yeah, there's there's no way that anybody could do anything to them now. But who knows what the future holds, right? Mm. Yeah, I'm just thinking with the way this, with the way the ROV is bobbing around, and presumably that's designed to cope with it. Yeah, yeah, you. You tangle and snap anything you sent down there with any kind of intent. Yeah. Little viewing gallery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are we doing looking at? Yeah, again, That's this is the inside. The, you can see the, the slope of the, the forward mm -hmm. edge of her funnel there. So we're actually at this point, we are, the ROV is basically over the flight deck looking outboard at the uh the inboard edge of her of her funnel and you can uh -huh. see i believe could be wrong anyway there's even even again even more of these little lockers mounted to the yeah, um, the hatches the railings you see ladders inside <laughs> yeah pretty cool it almost makes you want to get a wasp suit or something, you know, one of those little one man mini subs. Right, right. What could, what could you find inside? Yeah. Another one of her five inch mounts, I think. Mm -hmm. so. Crane of some description? Mm -hmm. Maybe her boat crane plane crane i don't know but yeah that's that's the crane so that would be right uh abaft her island then yeah because this is the starboard side because it's right the mud's Correct. much close mm -hmm. almost at an end of that footage but yeah if there's any yeah that's pretty much her yeah it gives you some idea because the, the, the lights on these things are not you know they're not your, your regular garden torch or whatever. These are some pretty powerful floodlights, and they're not really piercing all that far yeah. into the darkness. There's a huge, 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 huge amount of water sitting above them at the about above the ship at this point. Right. Wonder. Yeah, I mean, this is this is kind of where you want you know, like they did on Titanic. What was it, the second or third dive? They took down several ROVs, and one of them was just a mobile lighting grid. For, mm. for one of the others to for one of the other mini subs to film with yeah but this thing has to take all the power down with it for everything right anyway pretty mm. cool the the other good news uh, is that you know this is just the beginning of the footage um mm -hmm. you know there's hours and hours and hours of this stuff and i'm hopeful that uh eventually well i i know that they are intending on making it available to historians and scientists who want to get a hold of it again there's a question of how to do that in such a way that it doesn't give away the locations of the ships um and the other thing right now is physically it's just sitting on the Nautilus. All the 
you know, all the pixels. Uh, hmm. So hours and hours of 4K footage. There's there's going to be a powwow um, that I know Tony and I will be invited to to talk about. How do we disseminate this footage? Who gets axed? access to it etc cetera, etc cetera. but again amazing to think about the technological advances that we've had just in the last 20 years that we can get this high def footage and it can be broadcast live um, the fact that we were able to have a multidisciplinary team all looking at the same stuff in real time you know in multiple locations across the planet really really neat and I know, too, that uh, NOAA is planning to do a follow-up expedition. They're going to take a fancier ROV back and look again at these ships. But also, I believe the intent is going to be at least to try to find Soryu, because she should be relatively close by where Akagi was mm. found. And again, being able to look at the the physical spacing of those wrecks when she is found, that too will start to tell us more things about the configuration of the battlefield, um, you know, where these ships were relative to each other uh, when they were attacked and when they finally sank. It's possible too that, you know, if we can get back close to where the battlefield actually was, a lot of people were really keen on the notion of trying to find some of the aircraft from the battle. And yeah, obviously, you're not going to find any of the Japanese planes that were aboard these ships. They're all melted down to slaw. Um, but it's possible, you know, some of the torpedo planes that attacked American planes, you know, might have gone into the drink reasonably intact. I don't know. And and, and there might be some of the Japanese Zeros like, you know, Fujita uh, Iyozo, who was one of the, the Zero pilots that day. He ends up ditching alongside one of the carriers and, you know, getting rescued by one of uh, uh, one of the destroyers. So, you know, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that you could find the odd zero from the cap here or there down on the bottom as well. We'll see. Anyway, I super fun. Uh, definitely a highlight as far as my career as an historian, my so-called career. Um, <laughs> just. Again, being able to see all of this from the comfort of my study while I'm eating popcorn, I mean, it was it was amazing. Just amazing. Yeah, and of course, uh, as you say, that this, hopefully there'll be more footage made available soon. Um, I'm fairly sure someone at some point is going to go and revisit these wrecks, if, if as, for no other reason than as a reference point for, you know, finding Soryu, maybe Hiryu, maybe other yeah. bits and pieces yeah. that are down there. And technology, I mean, as you say, technology is only advancing. You know, back in the day, we could only dream of getting this high quality of footage, period, let alone live streamed. Yeah. Um, and yeah. now, now we've got this. And then, you know, who knows what five, 10 years down the line, we might have swarms of autonomous, uh, you know, underwater vehicles going around doing full 3D photogrammetry surveys of, right. of what's there and wandering out on their own across the abyssal plane looking for the odd odd aircraft or bit of wreckage right. yeah i i do think you know finding hear you is going to be pretty difficult because she's nowhere near here mm -hmm. um i mean the beautiful part uh about having a ship like the petrol which was funded by you know an eccentric billionaire who was into this kind of stuff is that they could take a pretty brute force approach to finding these wrecks it's just like okay we've got you know, two or three potential sinking points. We're just going to go out and lawn mower the ocean until we find these damn things because we have more money than God and we can. <laughs> um, I don't know that, you know, Nautilus, is, you know, necessarily has that same sort of leeway. But to your point that, yeah, you can imagine a world where there might be autonomous ROVs and I just take a half a dozen of these things and say, you <laughs> You boys go off and do your thing here until you find a chunk of junk that looks like it's worth broadcasting, you know, ET phone home and, you know, yeah. show me the side scan. And now I'll go back and, and send the actual photo sled down and take a look. Who knows? Anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. thanks so much for having well, me. This is great fun. Yeah, this has been great. I mean, it's um, I, I, I tuned into what I could of um of these live streams when they were happening but at the time that they were happening i think i just landed in seattle so 
right. time zone and jet lag wise i was completely out of it but you know it's really good to have a look through it and of course you know who better to have as a guide as to what the heck am i looking at other than random bits right. of shipping um, right. so but for you guys who've been watching this so far um if you have questions about what we you've seen over what's now probably going to be the, the last couple of videos if not three um at some point hopefully in november we will be sorting out a live stream so you've got a little bit of time to get your questions right. together um whether it be about this wreckage midway in general or whatever and uh we shall see you then <laughs> yes great fun all right Thanks very much once again for coming on. And uh, hopefully uh, at some point next year, when, when I'm back in the US poking at various ships and everything, we might get to uh, meet up again in person. That would be great. Would love it. All right. See you all around, everyone. Take care.